Hey guys, back again. This is going to be chapter three. I'm going to try to squeeze chapter four in. We'll see how it goes. Okay, let's go. Going to die, Brian thought. Going to die, going to die, going to die. This ho His whole brain screamed in the sudden silence. Going to die. He wiped his mouth with the back of his arm and held the nose down. The plane went into a glide very fast, a glide that ate altitude, and suddenly there weren't any lakes. All, all he'd seen since they started flying over the forest was lakes, and now they were all gone, gone. Out in front, far away at the horizon, he could see lots of them, glittering blue in the late afternoon sun, but he needed one right in front. He desperately needed a lake right in front of the plane, and all he saw through the windshield were trees, green death trees. <laughs> if he had to turn, if he had to turn, if he had to turn, he didn't think he could keep flying. The, pl the plane would keep flying. His stomach tightened into a series of rolling knots, and his breath came in short bursts. There. Not quite in front, but slightly to the right, he saw a lake, L-shaped, with rounded corners, and the plane nearly aimed at the long part of the L. Coming from the bottom, he headed to the top, just a tiny bit to the right. He pushed the right rudder pedal gently, and the nose moved over. The mo <clears throat> but the turn cost him speed, and now the lake was above the nose. He pulled back on the wheel slightly, and the nose came up. This caused the plane to slow dramatically and almost seemed to stop and wallow in the air. The controls became very loose feeling and frightened Brian, making him push the wheel back in. This increased the speed a bit, but it filled the windshield once more with nothing but trees and put the lake well above the nose and out of reach. For the space of three or four seconds, things seemed to hang, almost stop. The plane was flying, but so slowly, so slowly, it would never reach the lake. Brian looked out on the side and saw a small pond at the edge of the, saw a small pond, and at the edge of the pond, some large animals. He thought, a moose standing out in the water, all so still looking, so stopped. Only the pond and the moose and the trees, as he slid over them now, only three or four hundred feet off the ground, like a picture. And everything happened all at once. Trees suddenly took on detail, filled his whole vision with green, and he knew he would hit and die. He would die. But his luck held, and just as he was to hit, he came into an open lake, a channel of fallen trees, a wide place leading to the lake. The plane, committed to, now to landing, to crashing, fell into the wide place like a stone, and Brian eased back on the wheel, Embraced himself for the crash. But there was a tiny bit of speed left, and he pulled the wheel, and the nose came up, and he saw in front the blue of the lake, and at the instant the plane hit the trees. There was a great retching of the wings, caught the pines at the side of the clearing, and just broke back, ripping back. Ripping back just outside the main braces. Dust and dirt blew off the floor and into his face so hard he thought there must have been some kind of explosion. He was momentarily blinded and slammed forward in the seat, smashing his head on the wheel. Then a wild crashing sound, ripping of metal, and the plane rolled to the right and blew through the trees out of the water, down, down, and slammed into the lake. Skip once on the water, hard as concrete. Water that tore the windshield out and shattered the side windows. Water that drove him back into the seat. Somebody was screaming, screaming as the plane dove down into the water. Someone screamed tight animal screams of fear and pain. And he did not know that it was his sound, that he roared against the water that took him and the plane still deeper down in the water. He saw nothing but since blue, cold blue green and raked at his seatbelt catch, tore his nails loose on one hand, ripped it, ripped at it until it released somehow. And the water, trying to kill him, to end him, somehow he pulled himself out of one of the shattered front windows and cl clawed up into the blue, felt something hold him back, felt his windbreaker tear, and he was free, tearing free, ripping free. But so far... So far to the surface, his lungs could not do this thing, could not hold, and were through, 
and he sucked water, took a great pool of the water, and would finally win, finally take him. And his head broke into the light, and he vomited and swam, pulling without knowing what he was, what he was, what he was doing, without knowing anything, pulling until his hands caught on the weeds and the muck, pulling and screaming until his hands ca got caught in grass and brush, and he fell and he felt his chest on land and felt his face in the coarse blades of grass. And he stopped. Everything stopped. A color came that he had never seen before. A color that exploded in his mind with the pain. And he was gone. Gone from it all. Spiraling into the world. Spiraling out into nothing. Nothing. That was the end of chapter three. Chapter four. <clears throat> The memory was like a knife cutting into him, slicing deep into him with hate, the secret. He had been riding his 10 speed with a friend named Terry. They had been taking a run on a bike trail and decided to come back a different way, a way that took them past the Amber Mall. Brian remembered everything in incredible detail. He remembered the time on the bank clock in the mall flashing 331, then the temperature 82, and the date. All the numbers were part of the memory. All of his life was part of that memory. Terry had just turned um, to smile at him about something, and Brian looked over Terry's head and saw her. His mother. She was sitting in a station wagon, a strange wagon. He saw her, and she did not see him. Brian was going to wave or call out, but something stopped him. There was a man in the car. Short blonde hair, the man had wearing some kind of white pullover tennis shirt. Brian saw this and more, saw the secret and saw more later, but the memory came in pieces, came in scenes like this, Terry smiling, Brian looking over his head to see the station wagon, his mother sitting with the man, the time and temperature clock, the front wheel of his bike, the short blonde hair of the man, the white shirt of the man, the hot, hate slices of the memory were ex exact the secret. Brian opened his eyes and screamed. For seconds, he did not know where he was, only that the crash was still happening and he was going to die. And he screamed until his breath was gone. Then silence filled with sobs as he pulled air, half crying. How could it be so quiet? Moments ago, there was nothing but noise, crashing, tearing, screaming. Now quiet. Some birds were singing. How could birds be singing? His legs felt wet, and when he raised up on his hands, he looked back down in them, and they were in the lake. Strange. They went down into the water, and he tried to move, but pain hammered into him and made his breath shorten into gas, and he stopped, and his legs were still in the water. Pain. Memory. And he turned again, and the sun came across the water, late sun, and cut into his eyes and made him turn away. It was over then. The crash. He was alive. The crash is over and I am alive, he thought. And then his eyes closed and he lowered his head for a few minutes um, that seemed longer. When he opened them again, it was evening. Some of the sharp pain had abated, but there were many dull aches and the crash came back to him fully. Into the trees and out onto the lake, the plane had crashed and sunk into the lake and he had somehow pulled free. He raised himself and crawled out of the water, grunting with pain, um, with the pain of movement. His legs were on fire and his forehead felt as, as if someone had been pounding on it with a hammer, but he could move. His legs, pu he pulled his legs out of the lake and crawled onto his hands and knees until he was away from the wet, soft shore near a small stand of brush of some kind. Then he went down, only this time to rest, to save something of himself. He lay on his side and put his head on his arm and closed his eyes because that was all he could do now. All he could think of being able to do. He closed his eyes and slept, dreamless, deep and down. There was almost no light when he opened his eyes again. The darkness of night was thick, and for a moment he began to panic again. To see, he thought. To see is everything, and he could not see. But he turned his head without moving his body and saw that across the lake the sky was a light gray, and that the sun was staring, or was starting to come up, and he remembered that it had been evening when he went to sleep. Must be morning now, he mumbled almost in a hoarse whisper. As the thickness of sleep left him, the world came back. He was still in pain, all over pain. His legs were cramped and drawn up tight and aching, and his back hurt. When he tried to move, 
Oh, his back hurt when he turned to move. Sorry. Worse was was a keening throb in his head that pulsed with every beat of his heart. It seemed that the whole crash had happened to his head. He rolled on his back and felt his sides and his legs moving things slowly. He rubbed his arms. Nothing seemed to be shattered or even sprained all that badly. When he was nine, he had plowed his dirt bike into a parked car and broken his ankle. He had to wear a cast for eight weeks, and there was nothing like that now. Nothing broken, just battered around a lot. A bit, sorry. His forehead felt massively swollen to touch, almost like a mound out to or out cover his eyes. And it was so tender that when his finger grazed it, he nearly cried. But there was nothing he could do about it. And like the rest of him, it seemed to be bruised more than broken. I'm alive, he thought. I'm alive. It could have been different. There could have been death. I could be done. Or I could have been done. Like the pilot, he thought suddenly. The pilot in the plane, down in the water, down in the blue water, strapped in the seat. He sat up, or tried to. The first time, he fell back. But the second attempt, grunting with effort, he managed to come to a sitting position and scrunch sideways until his back was against a small tree where he was facing the lake, watching the sky get lighter and lighter with the coming of dawn. His clothes were wet and clammy, and there was a faint chill. He pulled the torn remnants of his windbreaker, pieces really, around his shoulders and tried to hold what heat his body could find. He could not think, could not make thought patterns work right. Things seemed to go back and forth between reality and imagination, except that it was all reality. One second, he seemed to only have imagined that there was a plane crash and that he had fought out of the sinking plane and swum to shore, that it had all happened to some other person or in a movie playing in his mind. Then he would feel his clothes wet and cold and his forehead would slash a pain through his thoughts and he would know it was real, that it had really happened. But all in a haze, all in a haze world, he sat and stared at the lake, felt the pain come and go in waves, and watched the sun come over the end of the lake. It took an hour, perhaps two. He could not measure time yet and didn't care for the sun to get halfway up. With it came some warmth, small bits of, um, small bits of it at first. With the heat came clouds of insects, thick swarming hordes of mosquitoes that flocked to his body, made a living coat of his exposed skin, clogged his nostrils when he inhaled, poured into his mouth when he opened it to take a breath. It was not a, it was not possibly believable, not this. He had come through the crash, but the insects were not possible. He coughed them up, spat them out, sneezed them out, closed his eyes, kept brushing his face, slapping and crushing them by the dozens by the hundreds but soon he cleared a place as soon as he killed them more came thick whining buzzing masses of them mosquitoes and some small black flies that he had never seen before all biting chewing and taking from him in moments his eyes were swollen shut and his face puffy and uh round to match his battered forehead he pulled the torn pieces of his windbreaker over his head and tried to shelter in it but the jacket was full of ribs and it didn't work and in desperation, he pulled his T-shirt up to cover his face, but that exposed the skin of his lower back, and the mosquitoes and flies attacked a new soft flesh of his back, and so viciously that he pulled the shirt down. In the end, he sat with the windbreaker, pulled up, and brushed his hands and took it, almost crying in frustration and agony. There was nothing left to do, and when the sun was fully up, heating him directly, bringing steam off of his wet clothes and bathing him in warmth, the mosquitoes and flies disappeared almost that suddenly one minute he was sitting in the middle of a swarm the next they were gone and the sun was on him vampires he thought apparently they didn't like the deep of night and perhaps it was too cool and they couldn't take the direct sunlight but in that gray time in the morning when it began to get warm before the sun was full up and hot he couldn't believe them Never in all of the reading in the movies he had watched or television about the outdoors, never once had they ever mentioned mosquitoes or the flies. All they ever show on the nature, the naturalist shows was a beautiful scenery or animals jumping around, having a good time. Nobody ever mentioned mosquitoes and flies. Ugh. He pulled himself up to stand against the tree and stretch, bringing new aches and pains. His back muscles must have hurt, have must have been hurt as well. They almost seemed to tear when he stretched. While the pain in his forehead seemed to be abating, 
somewhat. Trying to stand made him weak enough to nearly collapse. The backs of his hands were puffy and his eyes were almost swollen shut from the mosquitoes. He saw everything through a narrow squint. Now that there was much to see, he thought, scratching the bites from um, in front of him lay the lake, blue and deep. He had a sudden picture of the plane sunk in the lake, down, down, in the blue with the body of the pilot, all strapped in his seat, hair waving. He shook his head. More pain. That was something to think about. He looked at his surroundings again. The lake stretched out slightly below him, and he was at the base of the L, looking at the long part where the short part was out to his right. In the morning light, the calm water was absolutely perfectly still. He could see the reflection of the trees at the other end of the lake. Upside down in the water, they seemed almost like another forest. Upside down the forest to match a real one. He watched a large bird as he looked as he thought it looked like a crow, but it seemed larger. Flew from the top of the real forest, and the reflection bird matched it, both flying out over the water. Everything was green, so green it went into him. The forest was largely made up of pine and spruce, which uh, stands of some low bush smeared here and there, thick grass and some other kind of very small brush all over. He couldn't identify most of it except for the evergreens. Some of the leafy trees he thought might be aspens. He had seen the pictures of the aspens in the mountains and on television. The country around the lake was moderately hilly and the hills were small, almost hummocks, but there were very few roads except to his left. I'm sorry, very few rocks. There are no roads in the middle of the forest. <clears throat> there lay a rock ridge that <clears throat> struck out overlooking the lake, about 20 feet high. If the plane had come down a little to the left, it would have hit that rocks and never made it to the lake. He would have been smashed, destroyed. The word came. I would have been destroyed and torn and smashed, driven into the rocks and destroyed. Luck, he thought. I have luck. I had good luck there. But he knew that was wrong. If he had had good luck, his parents wouldn't have been divorced because of the secret, and he wouldn't have been flying with the pilot who had a heart attack, and he wouldn't be where he had uh, to have good luck to keep from being destroyed. If you keep walking back from good luck, he thought, you'll come to bad luck. He shook his head again, wincing. Another thing not to think about. The rocky ridge was rounded and seemed to be some kind of sandstone and bits darker, layered um, and stuck into it. Directly across um, the lake from it at the corner of the L was a mound of sticks and uh, mud rising up out of the water, a good eight or ten feet. At first, Brian couldn't place it, but he knew that, but he knew that he somehow knew what it was. He had seen it in films. Then a small brown head popped to the surface of the water near the mound and began swimming off with the short leg of the L, leaving the V of ripples behind, and he remembered where he'd seen it. It's a beaver house. It's called a beaver lodge, and in a special he'd seen on the public channel. A fish jumped, not a large fish, but it made a big splash near the beaver, as is, as if by signal there were suddenly little splops all over the sides of the lake along the shore. The fish began jumping, hundreds of them, jumping and slapping the water. Brian watched them for a time, still in a half daze, still not thinking well. The scenery was very pretty, he thought, and there were new things to look at, but it was all green and blue and blue blur, and he was used to the gray and black of the city. Traffic, people talking, sounds all the time, the hum and whine of the city. Here at first, it was silent, or he thought it was silent, but when he started to listen, really listen, it's me. Hmm. He heard thousands of things, hisses, blurks, small sounds, animals singing, humming of insects, splashes of fish jumping. There was great noise here, but a noise he did not know. The colors were new to him, and the colors and the noise mixed in his mind to make a green-blue blur. He could hear, hear as a hissing pulse sound as he was still tired, so tired, so awfully tired and standing. It had taken a lot of energy somehow and had drained him. He supposed he was still in some kind of shock from the crash. And there was still the pain. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. Whew. The dizziness and the strange feeling. He found another tree, a tall pine with no branches until the top. And sat with his back against it, looking down on the lake, 
with the sun warming him. In a few moments, he scratched down and was asleep again. That was chapters three and four. Can't wait for five.